This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. The fact that you're taking this data and converting it to electronics and switching it, converting it back to optics again, takes a tremendous amount of power. And that isn't necessary. And uh, there are uh, optical approaches, photonic switching approaches, which take very minimal amounts of power. And that's for a couple of reasons. One of which is because they're typically capacitors and, and they take virtually no power to switch. And the other one, as Dan Blumenthal points out, is that the electronic switches basically look at every bit. And they switch, they, just like your, your computer, looks at, looks at every bit and switches it. But there isn't, in most cases, a need to do that, particularly if you end up looking at video. If you're doing a video distribution system, you don't need to switch every bit. But rather, you can just switch packets or bursts or, or very long packets. And the amount of energy required to do that goes down dramatically. And uh, that's what's shown here, uh, perhaps 1,000x lower uh, power. To, required to do this. So again, as we start going from today's arrays of processors and servers to, to you know, many exascale sorts of, of systems, then this becomes extraordinarily important in terms of how these different processors communicate information back and forth. Oops. So this is an example of that. Uh, this is a variety of different electronic technologies for switching. And there's a variety of different ways to optical switching, whether it be MEMS or whether it be uh, mock center interferometers, which a lot of us here work on. Um, but the point being that it's something like factors of 20,000 less power per bit required to, to switch. So the horizontal axis here is capacity, and this is the amount of required, power required. So these are all commercial devices up here. And uh, maybe this works a little better. Um, but this is sort of what's inherently possible with optics. And so a lot of what we're working on in the Institute is how do you do very, very much lower power optical switching. And because it's just a capacitor, uh, you can really get tremendous capacity. Perhaps this is a terabit, you know, this is uh, 1,000 terabits with uh, less, than a, less than a watt worth of, of switching power. The other problem is that the pin count is extraordinarily high. And, uh, you know, if, if you talk with Cisco, again, as an example, or, or, or Intel, uh, one of the big problems is that as you go to modern chips, there's, there's thousands of pins. And that, that's obviously a mechanical problem. Uh, it's a very expensive approach. And the other problem is, is that the power required within these, these uh, processors are, is extraordinarily high. This is an example of a, of a multi-core IBM processor. And this takes 100 watts, similar to the numbers Justin mentioned this morning. And they're using something like 30 to 50% of the power on that chip is used for interconnects on chip and, and off chips. And the amount of data required to transmit around that chip is extraordinarily high, something like terabits of data. Uh, so it becomes very much a communications problem to solve these in the future. The approach that's being taken in general is, in, is stacking chips together. So rather than have separate memory and, and processors side by side, uh, the approach going forward is, is to, to reduce that latency between memory and processors and stack them vertically. And, uh, make a stack of chips which include processors and memory, and now in particular, photonic internet chip. And that's very much the research that we're working on at ECSB, is how do you make these photonic planes and integrate them with silicon electronics? And this is, again, as an example of a, uh, it's an IBM example of a four by four array of processors and uh, gateways in each one and then interconnected optically. And the idea being that by having a very high over uh, capacity of connections, then you can make uh, a variety of simultaneous connections without having to worry about contention. And uh, so that's, that's the issue is how do you make photonic devices on silicon? The basic problem is that silicon doesn't emit light. And so one approach is shown here. This is a CMOS process chip. It's got literally a million devices on it. 
And then they have four individual lasers. They chip, they mount on here one at a time, and uh, four down on this side. And that's not a very scalable approach if you really want to have thousands of lasers per die. So this is one of the problems we've been focused on, which is how do we increase capacity, how do we solve all these problems, and how do we get around the fact that silicon doesn't emit light? And so in the past, people have made devices out of phosphide or gallium arsenide. We've been looking very much at an approach called a hybrid silicon approach, where we combine thin layers of 3-5 materials on top of SOI waveguides. And this is an early result. It showed seven lasers integrated together. But just as a contrast to that previous picture, rather than dump mounting devices one by one, you can now do this on a wafer scale and literally make tens of millions of lasers at one time, of which one die, in this case, may have seven that are lasing. So that's been the general approach. We work on lasers, detectors, modulators, amplifiers. And the idea is to do all this in a CMOS facility and develop those technologies to do that. This is an example where we started from. We used to work on very small devices. We've scaled it up to two inch, four inch, and now six inch wafers. And these are all devices that have SOI waveguides for routing the information around in the chip. Uh, in this case, covered by the 3-5 material we use to get gain or absorption or amplification of, of the light signals. The goal is to get to a chip like this. And this is something uh, uh, Justin Ratner has shown before. It's, uh, say, an array of, of lasers, in this case, 25 DFB lasers, each a different color of light, followed by 25 modulators, each working at a fairly high speed, 40 gigabit per second. And then when you combine those different colors together, then you can get at the output a terabit per second. So obviously, the world now is going from sort of 10 gigabit Ethernet to 100 gigabit Ethernet. We're looking at what, what, what happens beyond that after, after the 100 gigabit Ethernet. And this is a way to do a terabit. And so we've worked very hard on these devices, and these have been demonstrated and worked fairly well. We've worked quite hard on these devices, and uh, the goal now is to integrate it all together. So the future, I believe, is basically low-power interconnects optically. Today, they're electronically, uh, both on-chip and off-chip. So certainly off-chip is the first thing which happens on-chip and not that far in the future. Once we have 1,000 cores on a chip, then, then this becomes imperative. The second thing I think which is definitely in our future is photonics made in CMOS fab fabs rather than dedicated 3-5 fab fabrication lines. And in general, just hybrid integration of CMOS and photonics. So today, electronics and photonics are largely separate industries, and uh, they come together in, in a module. I think we're going to see this 3D stacking of chips so as to get it all together. My group at the University of Melbourne has been looking at the energy consumption and energy efficiency of the internet, and as an engineer, I think of the internet as, a, as a, an engineering system with inputs and outputs. So here is the input uh, energy from the power grid feeding the, the network, and in the network there are a number of uh, key components, the, uh, the core network, uh, data centers, the metro edge network, uh, maybe video distribution networks for future IPTV, the access network that connects to the home. And so the engineering model is one of energy in and data out. And I'll say more about what these components of the network uh, uh, mean in a, in a few minutes. So why is energy important when looking at the, at the internet? Well, operational expenditure, the cost of uh, power to drive the internet, is becoming a, an increasingly important part of uh, the cost for network operators. There is, of course, the uh, greenhouse impact, and I'll be saying something about that in this talk. Uh, and there's also the, the, the growing engineering problem of energy-limited capacity and bottlenecks, or hotspots. So we, we've heard about uh, data centers today, but also switching centers in the, in the internet also have issues with increasing amount of heat being generated. And as the capacity of the network increases, uh, these uh, hotspots will become increasingly an, an engineering challenge. The good news, of course, as we've already heard from other speakers in this uh, conference, is that there are, uh, the, is the potential for enabling energy efficiencies in other sectors by appropriate use of the internet, and I'll be saying something about that as well. So to put things into context, I'm, again, I'm repeating something that's been presented in this uh, summit already, so um, my job's made easier for me. But just uh, for a little bit of repetition, this is data from the uh, Smart 2020 report that was uh, uh, published late last year, showing that in 2002, global emissions from all sectors uh, uh, are represented by the length of this bar, and the green bar represents the contribution by information and communications technologies, uh, which uh, is uh, 
very small compared with the total. In fact, I think I've got the percentage here. It's a, it's a few percent, whereas with business as usual, global emissions in 2020 will be uh, grow by this amount and the uh, contrib contribution due to ICT will still be a small part of the total. The good news, as we heard before, is that uh, the uh, abatements from ICT by uh, benefiting other sectors could be as much as this, and with other abatements, the uh, total greenhouse emissions in 2020 with abatements will be uh, something like this. This amount of ICT then, uh, translated to this re point, uh, region here, indicates that in fact in 2020, the, the total uh, contribution to uh, uh, greenhouse gases by ICT in 2020, taking these abatements into account, might be about 5%. So it's certainly not a, a large number, but every percent matters. And so it's certainly an area that we need to think about. So what would I like to do in this talk? I'm going to, to give an overview of our work on estimating how much energy is consumed in the network and giving you an idea where that energy actually is consumed. Uh, and the key components of the network, as I said before, are the core, the metro network, and the access network. I'll say a few words about cloud computing and uh, the implications of cloud computing on energy efficiency of the network. Uh, and a few words about travel replacement, uh, and you might be interested to, to see how airmail can be used to transport data and how compares, that compares with the internet in terms of energy efficiency. So here is the, uh, a, a slightly more detailed model of the internet showing an access network with connected to homes, and I've shown here a number of different technologies. There are a number of competing access technologies at the moment, and I'll say more about these in a minute. This connects to a metro or edge network, which is typically used in large uh, cities, to connect to the core network, uh, and through the, uh, the core network, access networks all around the country and all around the world can communicate. These are examples of the key components that are involved in the network, ethernet switches, uh, broadband network gateways and edge routers in the, in the uh, edge network. And the core network is basically a, a large number of routers. These blue disks represent uh, routers and you'll be hearing more about those in the next talk. And each of these green lines represents uh, a number of optical fiber links. So everything is connected by optical fiber. And over here we have a, a data center connected somewhere into the core network. And in the future, we're likely to see video distribution networks, which will be used to distribute uh, IPTV, either on demand or broadcast IPTV, to the user. And the, the unique feature of video distribution networks is they can be built more efficiently for uh, IPTV applications and therefore can end up being more energy efficient. Now, I don't have time to talk about all of these today, so in fact, uh, oh, before I get on to that, uh, I've just highlighted here, my graduate student did this, one of my graduate students did this animation for me, uh, some hotspots from the, uh, serv the server and the routers in the, in the data centers, and certainly there's likely to be hotspots in the future in the uh, routers in the core network. Now, I haven't got time to talk about all of these today, and so I'm gonna focus here on the access network, the Metro Edge network, and the core network and give you a feel for the, the kinds of numbers that are involved in, in energy consumption in those parts of the network. And I focus here on a fiber to the premises network, which involves a fiber all the way to every home. This is the, the bottom line. This is a, a, the result of an analysis which shows the, the energy consumed or the power consumed per user connected to the internet uh, plotted as a function of the peak access rate. This is the access rate that you buy from your ISP. And I've plotted this uh, in its comp components. This, this green line represents the optical fiber links connecting all parts of the network. The, uh, this purple line represents the, the access network, which in this case is fiber to the premises. And the access network uh, is basically independent of the peak access rate. With optical fiber, you can go up to fairly high peak access rates and it stays pretty much the same. Uh, this is, represents the energy consumed by the routers in the network, which increases quite dramatically as the peak access rate increases. Now I have to uh, uh, point out that this is all based on 2009 technology. And in a few minutes, I'll explain to you what happens if you start to make predictions about improvements in the technology in the future. So in practice, what's going to happen as peak access rates go up, 
uh, technology imp will improve, and this picture will change somewhat, and I'll, and I'll explain that to you in a moment. Also on the right here, I've plotted the, what this power in watts per user translates to in percentage of the electricity power in the electricity grid. Uh, and this is for a typical OECD country like Australia and the US. So, so at the moment, uh, where we stand with today's internet, the uh, peak access rate on average is about 3 megabits per second in 2009. At the moment, the, the energy or the power consumption in the network is dominated by the access network, and there's only a small component uh, due to the routers and a small component due to the optical fiber links. So at the moment, the internet, we estimate, uh, uses about half a percent of the electricity supply. This is just the telecommunications part of the network. It, exclu it excludes uh, data centers, which, as we've heard before, may account for two, maybe 2% of the total. So the, the network itself, the communications network, is using less energy than the data centers. And this, uh, these, this, these data also excludes the mobile telephone network um, uh, uh, in, in, as, as well as excluding uh, data centers. Uh, and this, uh, if we uh, predict a traffic growth rate of about 40% per, per annum, there are different predictions on how fast traffic is growing, but 40% is a, is a reasonable figure that many people would agree upon. Uh, we're, we're talking about um, being uh, close to 140 megabits per second by 2020, and on this graph it indicates that the routers with 2009 technology would consume about the same amount of, of power as the access network, and the total power consumed by the network would have doubled to around about 1%. Now, it's interesting to look at different access networks because different access, net te access technologies consume different amounts of power. And these are four typical access networks. Uh, fiber to the premises, uh, which is the one I showed on the previous slide, with fiber all the way to the home. Uh, fiber to the node, which takes fiber to a cabinet in the street somewhere near the home, and then there is active electronics in this, this uh, cabinet and copper pairs to the home. Uh, this fiber to the node is, is being rolled out in various parts of the US, as is fiber to the premises. Uh, wireless technology with a, fi a wireless transmitter and wireless to the home, and HFC, or cable television type technologies, which are widely used in the US. In fact, the US is the, the major uh, the country that has most uh, HFC in the world, with uh, fiber to a node and then copper uh, coaxial cable to the home. And we've compared the, the, the energy consumption of all of these access networks, and in this particular model we exclude the, the routers in the edge node and consider only the equipment in, the, in getting the data from the edge node to the home. And this uh, shows the results, again as a function of the peak's access rate and power to the user, and this is the data I showed before for fiber to the premises, which is pretty well constant. It does rise a little bit as you get to very high uh, peak access rates, but that's sometime in the future. And this M uh, corresponds to the oversubscription rate. That's basically how much, what your ISP sells you and what you can actually get uh, if uh, everyone uses the network. In today's uh, uh, network, uh, you, if everyone uses the, the network at the same time, you cannot get three megabits. You get about a 25th of that. So the, in today's network, the oversubscription rate is 25. Uh, but you can get M equals one with a uh, fiber to the node network, which means that everyone, or fiber to the home network, means everyone can use the internet at the same time and no one uh, uh, suffers. The uh, fiber to the node network uses about twice as much power uh, the hybrid fiber coax system, depending on how you arrange the oversubscription, uh, has the power increasing quite rapidly above about 10 megabits per second. And while there are now uh, upgrades coming for uh, cable television HFC networks, the energy consumption is going to increase dramatically as these are upgraded to higher bit rates. And finally, wireless is by far the, the uh, most power consuming, with about 20 watts per user at least. Uh, because there's a lot, of, a lot of power consumed in the RF transmitter. Now, the important conclusion out of this whole uh, study is that of all these technologies, fiber to the premises is, is the greenest, and it uses uh, considerably less power than all the others, and certainly is the only one that's really viable at very high bit rates. And in fact, uh, I come from Australia, and the Australian government just a very recently announced as part of a nation-building economic stimulus package, the Australian government has announced a $43 billion uh, rollout of fibre to the premises for 90% of all homes in Australia. And I know for a fact, because I was involved in the uh, committee that made the recommendation, 
that uh, the fact that uh, fibre to the premises is the most energy efficient of all the technologies, that was a factor in the Australian government in making a decision to go to fibre to the premises. Since so much energy is consumed in the access network, it's really important to think about how we can improve the energy efficiency of the access network. And a large amount of that energy actually is in the modems in the home. And the European Commission recently put out a code of conduct for energy consumption of broadband equipment, basically home modems. And this uh, is an extract from the uh, report, which is mandating that in the European Commission that home modems will have to have a low power state or sleep state that the modem goes into when uh, no data is being transmitted. So you can leave the modem switched on and it will wake up quickly if some data arrives, but when it's not being used, it goes into a low power state. And these are mandated uh, energy uh, power consumptions that have been uh, mandated by the Euro European Commission. And things, uh, activities like this will greatly reduce the uh, energy consumed by the access network. It's very interesting to think about the internet as a mechanism for delivering data from one place to another and think about how the, the energy efficiency of the network in terms of the energy consumed per bit of data that's transmitted over the network. And this is uh, data taken from one of my earlier graphs, now converted into energy per bit as a function of the peak's access rate. And we're, as I said, today down around three megabits per second. So at the moment, in today's network, uh, the, the routers uh, consume about one microjoule per bit. And in today's network, the total energy consumption is about 100 microjoules per bit. So if you send a, a, a bit of data from one place on Earth to another place on Earth, it will consume for that, that uh, one bit of data about 100 microjoules. And this number, by the way, is consistent with the number we heard earlier about the energy consumed for a, a Google uh, search operation. The energy in the transmission of the data uh, is smaller than the, the total, but these numbers are consistent. So this is a graph very similar to the one that uh, John showed just a moment ago, showing the energy per bit for different uh, types of equipment used in the network. And, and on the far right, there is a, a server, perhaps a voice, a video, uh, uh, IP video uh, server, um, or a passive optical network, ONU, that's the unit in the home. These uh, are only used once in the network, either at the server end or at the receiving end. Uh, so the fact that they have fairly large energy, consum energy consumption is not a disaster. Um, but for these other components appear in many places through the network. And if I transmit data from one place in the network on Earth to another place on Earth, then it will pass through, through many core routers, many Ethernet switches, and many uh, packet, this is, represents packet over sonnet optical fiber transmission systems. And so uh, the, while there are many transmissions through these, the fact that the energy is lower means that the, the total is not, uh, doesn't uh, uh, dominate. And still, in fact, the uh, ONUs and the core routers that is the largest uh, consumer of energy of the lot. So this, this idea of thinking about bits of uh, data passing from one place to another in the internet and the energy consumed to move one bit of data, I think is a very useful way to, to think about how the energy in the internet uh, yeah, can be calculated. So I'd like to say now a few more words about core routers, this one here, and Gary Epps in the next talk will expand on what I've got to say here. So this is data, in fact, from Gary from a couple of years ago showing the performance as a function of time for state-of-the-art routers. Uh, and these green dots represent actual Cisco devices. And it, what this shows is that the router capacity has been growing at about a factor of 2.5 every 18 months. That's a very rapid growth in router capacity. Uh, by comparison, Moore's law is about twice in, uh, as a growth of twice the number of uh, devices in, in, in 18 months. And uh, CMOS energy efficiency is somewhat less than that. The, the energy effic efficiency of CMOS improves by about 40% per annum. So this improvement in CMOS energy efficiency uh, can be translated into improvement in the energy efficiency of the routers and other equipment in the network. And this is the a way that we can uh, anticipate that that growth of energy consumption of the network that I predicted can be reduced as technologies improve and as uh, more energy efficient routers are produced. 
So this is one set of data from Nielsen a few years ago, uh, looking at data from a number of sources, suggesting that the router improvement of, uh, is about 20% per annum. So about half of what CMOS gives us an improvement in electronic devices, uh, engineers have been able to translate about half of that into a, uh, the improvement that you can get in a, in a piece of equipment like a router. So this is the, the graph that I showed you before, showing the access network uh, energy is about the independent of time or access rate, and that the router energy uh, consumption increases quite rapidly, and here is the total. So let's just focus on the total, and this now is for a 0% improvement rate. You recall that I, this was all calculated for 90, uh, 2009 technology. What happens now if we predict the 20% improvement each year in the energy efficiency of the routers, what will happen? Well, in fact, we've done this for a number of different uh, improvement rates. Uh, this is for 5%, 10%, and 20%. And if, uh, if you get a 20% improvement, this is, in fact, the total improvement rate. If, if the whole network improves in efficiency by 20% per annum, then we can pretty well hold the line on energy consumption uh, due to the fact that the en energy consumption increase in the, in the uh, routers is not too large. If, in fact, you replace uh, all equipment that's seven years old is not quite so good. There is a small increase in energy consumption, but it's manageable. So I think the good news here is that while uh, the, the internet will expand quite considerably, and maybe we'll be talking about uh, hundreds of megabits per second in the not too distant future, if it's possible to continue to build equipment that's 20% more efficient each year, then the, the overall efficiency of the network will, will pretty well stay uh, unchanged and we'll keep at around this 0.5% of total electricity supply. Now, I'd like to say a few words about cloud computing. Uh, this uh, diagram shows how uh, in, the, in the home you might have a computer and storage, and in the network there will be maybe enterprise data centers and public data centers where computing and storage can be done elsewhere. And the, the interesting question is, does it make sense to do all your computing and storage in your home or office computer, or does it make sense, where appropriate, to use uh, enterprise or public data centers and uh, storage and com computational resources elsewhere? Um, and you might even uh, choose to put these uh, data centers near uh, sources of renewable energy. And in the common parlance these days, days, this is often referred to as the cloud. It's basically the network out there somewhere. You don't have to know where this public data center is. I never know where Google's uh, uh, data center is when I do a Google search. I don't have to worry about that, but it's somewhere in the cloud. So the question is, does it make sense to do this? And what are, what are the energy implications of using cloud computing with home computing? Now, this is something which it's a big question, and I don't claim to have all the answers to it but we've been doing some work in this area where we're looking at the total energy consumption for doing some processing job. And the way of thinking about this is you think about the energy per bit used in the storage, whether it's in the home or the office or in the cloud, the energy used for transport and the transport of data from the home to the cloud if you're using cloud computing, but the transport is much less if you're doing it in the home, and there's also the processing power. And then if you multiply this by the total number of bits, you can work out the energy, uh, either in home computing, office computing, or in the cloud. And here is one example of some results that we've uh, obtained, which show that if you were using a computer for video encoding, half-hour videos, and on this graph I've shown how if you work out that if you plot as a, number of, as a function of the number of encodings per week, the average power consumed, on an older computer, it's quite large because old computers use a fair amount of energy. But a mid-range computer, you can, you could do um, uh, this video encoding at home, uh, and it, even if you do a fairly large number of encodings per week, it doesn't use too much power, about 80 watts. If you use a low-end computer and use outsourcing over the cloud, if you only do a number, of, a small number of encodings per week, you can actually save power, and it makes sense to have a small home computer and do computing over the network. But if you do a, a large number of codings, in this region here, the power is larger. And the reason for that is that there, there is energy consumed in the transport of the data over the network. So cloud computing doesn't come free. And the more data that you're going to use to, to uh, move from your uh, computer to the cloud and then back again, then at some point uh, the uh, transport energy can dominate and the energy overall energy efficiency can be reduced. Now, very quickly, because I'm running out of time, 
You know, I live in uh, Melbourne. Uh, Sydney is about a thousand kilometres away, and I could uh, put uh, three by ten to the five uh, uh, thirty-two gigabyte flash drives um, on a, into uh, uh, into the mail. This is the Australian equivalent of uh, the US Post, and I could take it to an airport, and I could get that many flash drives inside the cargo hold of a seven forty-seven, and I could fly it to Sydney. And if you do the calculations, it would take it would use about uh, a Ten, uh, about a thousand kilograms of CO2, and it would take 24 hours by the time the, all the deliveries were done. If I do it by the internet, from a number of users, this corresponds to 10 to the 7 gigabytes. With a terabyte of data uh, bandwidth on the network, it would take 24 hours, the same amount of time. Um, and it would uh, require 10 to the 5 kilograms of CO2. It would generate more energy, more CO2 than flying. The, uh, the, the flash drives to Sydney on a, on a cargo jet. So the en energy per bit here is uh, two microjoules per bit. This is in the future when the energy uh, of the internet is uh, less, uh, and this uh, corresponds to only tw 20 nanojoules per bit. So the, uh, the, the network, on, don't misunderstand me here, I'm not for a minute suggesting we shouldn't use the internet, but my, but my message here is that Transport of data on the internet is not free, and it does come at an environmental cost. Uh, I think I'll skip this one. Here is my previous graph with the flash drives by email. It's less. Video conferencing is good news. I came here from Australia on a 747, um, and I, I hate to admit it, but I've generated 5,000 kilograms of CO2 in coming to Santa Barbara from Australia. If we use high-definition vid video conferencing, say two gigabits of, of uh, video conferencing for 18 hours to take in all the things that are going on around this symposium, it would have only been about 15 kilograms of uh, CO2. So I would have been far better for the environment if I'd stayed in Melbourne and used uh, high-definition video. And I think I'll, I've, done a, I've got a telecom calculator which shows that if, if I plot the distance that I travel as a function of the amount of data I need to transfer, uh, and I've plotted this in terms of megabit hours or gigabit per second hours, and then I take into account whether I fly, go by a train, car, or plane, the idea is any, everywhere below these lines, it's better to travel uh, to, to do the work. And if, I, if I'm above the lines, then it's uh, better to telework. So at the moment, I've come about 20,000 kilometres. I said here, this is about the amount of data I'd need if I was going to do it by video conferencing. I should have stayed in Australia and done it by, by video. Uh, and my daily work, in fact, it's, I'm better off to, to, uh, to telework than to travel. Although I do ride a bicycle, so in fact I'm better off. So I haven't got time to talk about the Kazoom Brooks uh, postulate because I've run out of time, but someone might like to ask a question about that. So in summary, the energy consumption of the network is uh, small but growing, um, and the energy is dominated by the access network. And so in focusing on reducing the uh, energy consumption, increasing the efficiency of the internet, the prime focus really needs to be on the access network and the user modems, that little box that sits in your home. And the core network consumption is relatively small, but a key to keeping it low is improvements in the efficiency of the network equipment. And I guess we'll hear more about that in the next talk. Thank you. I want to start off with the rationale behind why I'm focused on energy efficiency, or one of the reasons why I'm focused on energy efficiency. Cisco is your very typical large Silicon Valley company. We have a green strategy. We have a green department. We've got a green vice president. We've got a green everything. I'm not here to tell you about our green strategy, but one of, the, one of the main aspects of our strategy, of course, is greenhouse gas reduction and good things like that, is how we go about it. Is the approach we're taking is to use a very heavy emphasis on IT and networking. Does that ring a bell from what we've already heard today? The list of, the list of areas that, we, that we're going to use is also a checkoff list of things that we've heard from people. We're going to use telepresence collaboration techniques to stop airplanes flying people around the world. Um, you've no doubt seen all our you know, horribly cute television commercials which show big screens and people smiling at each other from across the world. It saves people from traveling. It's great. Uh, IP-enabled facilities. We've again heard about that. We're, we're retrofitting buildings. We're making telecommunications uh, systems talk to building management systems with uh, lighting and air conditioning so that when I'm in the office, my air conditioning is on. When I'm out of the office, my air conditioning is off and my telephone is off and so on and so on. 
we're introducing all those sort of things. Uh, labs and data centers, we've heard enough about labs and data centers today. It was all exactly the same kind of thing where you, you, where you design data centers with, with good sensible design there. Improved product efficiencies. Now, what cooks all these equipment together often has a Cisco badge on the front of it. So in order to make our own corporation take less power, it would be wise for us to make our own products take less power. Now that's the bit that I want to talk to you more about today, and that is clearly both motivated by our own corporate needs, plus it's for the good of everybody that we make you know, greener products. And of course, as we, as we would, we would participate in many of these bodies around the world where, where we're contributing um, standards or reviewing or, or responding to the mandates to make power reductions in certain classes of products. So, so we have an interaction with all those. Now, there's not a lot of what I'm saying yet is rocket science. Maybe nothing I say is rocket science, who, who knows. But there's not a lot of things that are rocket science about how you reduce the power in an electronic component. You either reduce the peak power that it takes, which might mean when the product is doing work, make it take less power to do the same work. And that's actually what I want to speak mostly about and, and the technology behind that. You can reduce the average power. Now that's very much not rocket science. That's find something, which, find something which is doing work that it doesn't need to do. Turn something off that you believe is not needed. And again, we've heard about this with, with various people, speakers beforehand, whether it's at the microchip level or whether it's at the box level. And an easy example is that thing there is a set-top box. A set-top box that you, Scientific Atlanta is a brand of ours. There's millions and millions of these set-top boxes out there right now today with a disk drive in it. That disk drive spins 24 by 7. I have a TiVo at home right now that's spinning 24 by 7. It's burning power. I'm not watching TV on it right now. If I could put some software in there that says, you know what, if no one's watching the television for 15 minutes and I'm not prepared to record something, how about we stop spinning the disk drive? Now, that is not bolts of lightning from the sky kind of rocket science, but that kind of revelation is what this whole industry, particularly in the networking here, is what we need. It only requires you know, recognition that something like that needs to happen, maybe a, uh, a protocol between a, you know, a, a building management system and a telephone system, so to say, you know what, the, there's a telephone in my office right now burning nine watts of power, it's an IP telephone. The fact that I'm not in the office, maybe it could stop burning that nine watts if it knows that I'm not in the office. So very simple things like that are what are gonna drive us to getting the, the best bang for our buck. It's very much low hanging fruit there. And there's many, many examples that I could give of simple things within Cisco that we're doing to, to make dramatic reductions in power, in power, average power efficiency. They're not very sexy, but they are making big, big gains. And then the third kind of category of ways of reducing power is to reduce the average power of a network. And that very much goes to what the, the data center guys are talking about. If I've got um, computing facilities in three places in the world, and I've got a bunch of work that I want to do in those facilities, maybe I should redirect that work to a facility that's at night right now, or that's in winter, so that its cooling bill is a lower, it's, it's simpler for its cooling system. Or using virtualization, there's many, many techniques here. Uh, I'm not expert in those techniques myself, but those again are where you can save power. Now each of these three categories are in fact all, can I get a, uh, just a glass, because I'm getting a bit of a dry mouth. Not sure there's a glass. Oh, yes, there is. Oh, my mistake. Each of these three categories are additive. So independently, we're working on all three of them. We have no need to trade off one versus the other. Now, my own, my own world is reducing the peak power of my routers, that, because as you'll see in a minute, there's much more opportunity there. Now, if we look at all the kinds of products that we have, there's really two kind of ways you can look at them. There's economically driven products, such as little wireless home routers, that sort of thing. We've probably all got one of these sitting in our desks, right in our, in our office right now, burning 10 watts, next to a computer that's probably burning five watts, because it's sleeping right now, next to a modem, next to a printer, next to all those things there. They're all burning power. Wish we could turn that off, don't we? But these things are economically driven. The definition of this product is, don't come back unless you've made the shelf price of that product $39.95. Do as fast as you can within that envelope, but that's what drives that kind of product. Whereas this kind of product over here, which is, happens to be an internet core router, but it's representative of this class, it's don't come back unless you have got enough capacity to, to meet the requirements for the people in that, that world. Now, if we look at the efficiency of a product down this end of the scale, 
This thing is around a megabit per second of capacity, maybe 10 megabits in some cases, but just say on average it's about a megabit of capacity. And it burns about 10 watts to do that. If I want to make that efficiency, if I want to make that product more efficient, I have to spend money. I have to, say, spend another dollar on the power supply. So, you know, the little plug that you plug into the wall with the little watt. If I want to make it a more efficient product, that'll be one of the bigger contributors to it, so I spend another dollar. Adding a dollar to the cost of that thing there causes people to have a heart attack. It would be a big deal for people in that class there. So it's driven by cost to what the efficiency there is. So it's not like I can't make them more efficient, but now I'm going to have to get out of my price range or my, my comfort range there. Whereas with the stuff on the right here, this is of the order of one of, one of these racks. I should probably guess I used the wrong picture. One of these columns here is of the order of a terabit of capacity. That's a million times the capacity of this thing here. And it consumes about 10 kilowatts. That's a thousand times the capacity of this thing over here. Now, if I want to make this thing on the right more efficient, it doesn't matter what money I spend. I have to find technology that can do the work. And I'm going to expand into that a bit more. But it's, it's a, I need silicon that can do more work for the same power or analogous things like that. And then just to really beat you on the head with it, there's a thousand times difference in the efficiency here. This, this kind of class of equipment where there's high utilization, very, very high multiplexing of, of the workload onto it, is very, very power efficient. Whereas this thing here is very, I won't say inefficient, but it's a thousand times less efficient. There's a million of these things out there for every one of those. In addition, these things here are, are on average very lightly used. On average, these things here are very heavily used. 24 by 7, the core of the internet is moving data. Yes, there's diurnal shift. You know, every day there's a peak and there's a trough. But these days, with all the nighttime bit torrenting and people moving around files and everything, the difference between the peak load and the minimum load is not that much. And I'll, I'll go into that in a second. Um, where's my button? So I'm, I really want to talk more about the right-hand side. The left-hand side, yes, it's absolutely where a lot of focus is, a lot of focus should be, and there's a lot of gain to be made there. But from the technologist's point of view, which, which I am, I want to talk more about what happens with the, the stuff on the right, because those are very big, power-hungry boxes, and it draws a lot of interest from people that they see, wow, that's a lot of power. You know, Rod Stewart's putting little wavy lines on them. Is there a problem there? So let's talk about the power. Let's talk about what drives power. Over time, technology gets more efficient, you know, the, the raw technology, whether it's the silicon or whether it's disk drives or CPUs, whatever it may be. I can choose, as a system designer, I can choose to scale my system at a rate that's less than what the technology gives me, and therefore my overall system power declines. Now, that might be what I want to do if I'm making a battery-operated cell phone or a PDA or a laptop computer or something in that kind of class. That may be good business for me to do that or good, interesting to do. However, most of us who make big equipment, whether it's big computers or big routers, whatever, are really greedy. We love scaling our things so that we've got more capacity and more, you know, our cost point becomes better and everything. So we usually will historically scale our systems faster than the technology underlying them, which means the absolute, you know, cord going into the wall power increases over time. And that certainly is the case for, for my systems, and I'll go into that in one second. Now, this is just another version of a chart that we've all seen, and no, there's no point looking at the specific categories and the detail there. It's just basically an acute exponential that's going up and to the right, never-ending. It's showing that traffic on the internet is growing. It's going to keep growing for, for, you know, for the foreseeable future, driven by video, driven by whatever. We can talk about that over a beer. You'll see here the number 46% compound annual growth rate for, you know, for, those, for those years that they've studied there. And that's been, that's been validated by many of our large service providers who, who give us their projections and what they need in their routers. So this is not only just our sort of marketing collateral here. This is, is true data from, from service providers in the internet core. Um, one other thing I'll just point out here. This, this is actually a Cisco report that we, we've published on our website. But it has the word zettabyte in it. And I bet you nobody's ever heard of the word zettabyte. I've never heard of it before. And it's, if you look it up, it's 10 to the 21 bytes. So that's a... A thousand million gigabytes, I think it is. Whatever it is, it's the largest number I've ever seen in my life. It's like, it's a number you can go home and tell your kids and friends about, hey, you've seen the word zettabyte actually used in real battle. But it, there is a staggering amount of data moved on the internet. And yes, it's going to mostly be um, um, video driven. So here's yet another picture of the internet simplified in yet another different way, but you'll see the major, the major components are exactly as, as Rod showed. 
you've got stuff on the left here which is where data is consumed, whether it's your iPhone putting data into a mobile tower or whether it's you watching, you're playing on your computer or using your telephone or watching movies on your TV screen or you're a business doing whatever you're doing. Data gets into the network through a technology. It's not important what the technology is. The data all comes into what we'll call the... Oh, none of my colours came out here, but into the aggregation layer here. It's not important what the topology that is. Ultimately, the data either goes to... Uh, and then Rod alluded to what we'll call video, video caching here, and that's absolutely happening now. Many service providers are providing that. You know, at and has got their... Um, um, I've already forgotten the name of it. Oh, apologies to at and But anyway, but, but they've got, you know, you can do watch video on demands from a server that's geographically sensible for where you are watching it, so it doesn't have to travel over as much internet core to get there. That's all good business for them. But ultimately, all this traffic will go to what we call the core of the internet, where these large hockey pucks are and the, the, the fancy optical connections between them are. Those big routers are, those are the things that I've been designing for many years now, and that's what I want to tell you a little bit more about, because those are differently constrained to what the rest, of this, the rest of the equipment is. There's a picture of a large instance of one of them. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There are ten racks worth of equipment with orange spaghetti optical fiber hooking them together to make one managed router. That's the size of the router. Now, the, the biggest deployed one is probably only uh, the first six of those, but, but they're, they're, it's expandable. So that's the kind of class of equipment we're talking about that's in the core of the internet today. You know, AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, all the big boys, that, this is the, the stuff that they have. Each of these racks here is 13 kilowatts, or potentially 13 kilowatts if it's at its maximum. Usually it's not maximum, there's, a, there's an average there. But, um, and so that takes some certain facilities challenge to, pull, to put that sort of thing. Much like the data center guys are talking about how, you know, I've got racks of equipment in a data center that I need to cool and heat and everything. Exactly the same situation here. Now here's a variant of the same chart that Rod showed, but this is sort of the, uh, you know, from the horse's mouth kind of thing. Each of these red dots, I'm going to show you the history of these, these high-end routers that I just showed you there. Each of these red dots shows you the relative capacity of the high-end routers that are used in the internet, Cisco's particular products that, uh, that I've had a hand in there. And they're all just on a normalized scale. It's not important what the absolute scale is, but as you can see, it's growing up and to the right. These green dots, however, are the absolute power, or I should say the relative power, back to this 1993, the relative power of those same systems. Now, you can see two things here. Firstly, you can see that the green line is starting to level off. In fact, it pretty much has leveled off because of a facilities issue, and I'll come back to that in a second. But the other thing is that the purple line is the average. It's like the red divided by the green. It's the, it's the capacity per watt that our systems have been, have been able to demonstrate. So back in the good old days when the internet was growing like gangbusters, yep, we were growing like gangbusters. But it's now, you'll notice, there's a certain sort of a, I don't know, asymptote, whatever you call it. It's, it's reached a certain steady state here. It's, it's, it's growing, that's good, but it's not growing at the rate that it was before. Now you'll find out that the blue line here is not my product. That's actually a bunch of data points from my ASIC vendor. My ASICs are, my ASICs are the chips that I designed that go into the, chip, into the router. They're large, extremely large silicon chips. They are loaded with gates. They're, they're very much like what the in, what the Intel speaker told us about uh, with CMOS and all those good stuff like that. And as you see, every kind of generation of Moore's law, these, these devices got more power efficient. So this is representing the capacity per, per watt. They got more power efficient, but there's sort of like a, early in the 2000s, there was sort of like a change in slope, and it's gone to this slope here. Now, not remarkably, little animation here, the slope of the blue line is the same as the purple line. That's because my systems are dominated by the silicon within them, like the power of my systems is dominated by the underlying silicon. So if I want my, my router efficiency to deviate from that projection of that blue line, I need to do one of two things. I need to use the silicon differently, which is like I need to architect my box differently, make it do different work to get that capacity, different work inside of it, whether it's processing less packets with less complexity or whatever it may be, I'll go into that. Or I have to change the te technology, not use silicon, or something equivalent like that. So let me, uh, where's the button? So the, the practical constraints of putting a very, very high power system, as, as again we saw with, uh, with the data center guys, is that I have to go into facilities that are built many years ago. Google and Microsoft, they can build a brand new data center designed to whatever capacity they need with whatever economic and physical constraints that reality checks have to put into there. But 
I have to put my equipment into telco facilities which were designed in the 1960s for two kilowatt equipment per rack, and I have to put five times that amount of stuff into the same floor space. So they have to do things like leaving empty racks, empty bays between these racks of my equipment to amortize the BTUs that are coming out of this system because the air conditioning facility cannot be upgraded any more than what it has been. They've maxed it out. The place is full of band-aids effectively to, to try and increase their cooling capacity, but they just can't go beyond where they are right now. And as you see here, this is the power feed. They're already using DC power feed in their facilities. That's a telco standard here. Each of these is a 60 amp feed. Pair of, pair of wires. Each pair of wires is a 60 amp uh, feed into these, these routers. Uh, they have to design for the worst case because as they, this is like a modular system. You plug in line cards as you need that capacity. You kind of pay as you grow. But the thing is, when they install this system, the time frame between saying, I need the capacity to when it can be installed and brought up and managed and everything is very long. So they just need to install the, the appropriate maximum power and maximum cooling from day one for whatever their, their, their system capacity needs to be. So that's unfortunate that they can't, they can't really change the dynamic load on these things to save on cooling and power because they have to install that facility there. There's also a little opportunity for me to reduce the average power on these systems because, like I said, the internet in the core is there's so much multiplexing of all the different things going on that it, the, the average load, it, it has the, 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 the average, you know, the, the, the daily kind of peaks and valleys. But the difference between the peak and the valley is not enough for me to have an opportunity to turn something off. It's very difficult for me to turn some component of my system off and save that power when I'm trying to be what we call carrier class. I've got 911 calls going through this thing, so they expect this thing to be up with all sorts of parts that are redundant, you know, with 99.999% uptime, and all these sort of great things that are reliable, reliability related, and I'm turning things on and off. It's very, very difficult to do that. We are looking for opportunities to do that but we have not yet had a way to really find success in saving power doing that. So can I continue my growth with the efficiency gain that I have in the, on that pre previous chart there? Um, I believe I can. I'm, I think I'm good to go, but some of the things I'm doing are I'm doing as many power efficient techniques as I can. I mean, it's not a secret that there's certain, there's certain ways to use silicon that are more power efficient than others. As, as I think um, Justin told us, when you make a CPU, Gone are the days when we say, oh, the next CPU will be 2 gigahertz, then 3 gigahertz, then 4 gigahertz, then 5. Gone are those days. We now look at, okay, we now look at, oh, this CPU's got dual core. This one's got quad core. And they're running at a modest CPU because it takes a lot less power to do two cores at a certain speed than to do one core at even 50% higher speed. So we've been doing that for many years um, for, for our packet processing, packet processing designs. Uh, reducing the over-engineering. These systems are very custom. So each of these little black areas there's a, is a heat sink on one of our ASICs. These ASICs are very, very, we'll say, custom functionality. There's, there's queuing and buffering and packet processing and framing and all sorts of complex things which are not well suited for a general purpose CPU. They're very well custom machines that we have to build here. As we build these machines, we are effectively speculating on what the right level of functionality is and what the right performance and scale is for the requirements of the internet in the future. But as we know, the internet is a kind of wild and wacky place where unexpected things happen, killer apps come up, things that we didn't expect are introduced. So we may sometimes have over-engineered like a, few, a little more performance at this function than maybe are needed. So as time goes on, we, we just tune that down and add more of that power back into, or that functionality back to other areas. So we're constantly adjusting what, what, the, what the profile of our functionality is. Um, but the good news is that, to sort of tie into what Roger's talking about, 20% per year average efficiency gain appears very achievable for, for the foreseeable future, let's say five plus years, five to seven years, say, uh, with, without doing grossly radical technology change, staying on the CMOS silicon path with whatever architectural changes I know I've got and the, and the silicon that comes with that. Let's just illustrate some of the packet processing ASICs. This is just pictures of the ASIC. I thought I'd throw some eye candy in. I haven't had any for a few slides. So this is, this is a, a chip, and you'll see there's lots of little iterated processes that we put on here. That's the way we make our processes go fast rather than putting one very large high-speed one. We, we paralyze these things, standard sort of thing. But then as far as alternate technologies, we're absolutely engaged with, particularly with UCSB, with, with John Bowers' group and Dan Blumenthal's group and other people here with um, some of the optical photonic work that they're doing. Uh, it's, it's interesting 
when the time and place comes, you know, we'll, we'll see how we can integrate that into commercialized products. But for now, we're very much, we're, we're assisting, we're, we're, we're learning. Um, that's more or less a picture of what uh, I think Rod, who had a picture of, I think you had it, the picture of like, you know, multiple cores and on a processor talking optically to each other. And, and you see other cute things here. There's a, there's a particular project going on here at UCSB that's been funded for a few years um, from, it's a DARPA-based project, which is called LASER, with an O. Uh, and uh, so Cisco's been heavily involved with that. It's to build an optical packet switch, like an optical packet router. The top half of this page is all optical components. I don't understand the optical stuff. It's all, you know, it's all uh, gibberish to me, but the, the, it's absolutely world-leading stuff. The, the, the challenge is that there are still a bunch of stuff that's still done electronically that still burns a lot of power. And so one step at a time, there is now you know, demonstration and proof of the fact that you can get a lot of this functionality done optically. And then now to wrap up, um, from the high-end router point of view, uh, yes, these things are very high power. The, you know, 12 kilowatts for a single chassis of equipment is a staggering amount of power but there's only one of those for every million of those other routers, if you know what I mean. So that as a total percentage, as, as Rod's data was showing, it's an inconsequential percentage of the total internet's power. And really, my life is more constrained by just needing that router to be less power, just for, for me to get my growth, rather than it being made yet more efficient because of you know, intentions of making the world greener. Not that to say there's nothing, nothing uh, uh, bad about doing that. We are looking at all, all sorts of technology alternatives. One of, the, one of the things with this kind of class of product is that it takes about you know, three to five years from an idea to making a product in that space. There's an awful long um, runtime in, in taking that idea to fruition. So we have to be looking ahead in technology as much as we can. But then on the broader, broader subject of the internet, uh, Obviously, this is a very visible issue here. It's the reason why we're here. We've got entire, you know, we've got entire groups looking at this within Cisco. Everybody's mandated to reduce their power within their product lines. I didn't want to bore you with specific instances of all that because it's, like I say, a lot of it's not rocket science. It's just, oh, finally, you've, you've, done, you've done the obvious thing. You've, you've used this technology or you've made that component talk to this component so that it can power each other off or wake each other up, all that sort of thing there. Um, and like I say, the hard and easy problems. Hard in that sometimes it's just practically hard, but easy in that it's, you know, even, even an idiot like me could see that that's, you know, stop the disk drive spinning, but it just has, it has, has difficulties. So with that, I believe I've just used up my time, so uh, should I throw it to questions?